Hello and welcome once again to my YouTube channel. About uh, two weeks ago, I was invited to say a few words on Astro in Malay, which I did. And the topic of the discussion at Astro at that time was something to do with the monarchy and the, uh, the role of the scholars in the royal institution. And um, they informed me that the show was supposed to be for younger audiences. And therefore, I was trying to make it as basic and simple as possible. Tonight, however, after some feedback from that show, I've been asked to continue a little bit and to try to elucidate a little further what we actually mean by the correlation or the relationship between the monarchy and uh, the scholars. Now, to be, to be truthful, we cannot draw parallels between the Muslim civilization of the past, the monarchies of the past, and the monarchy in this country, because this is obviously what they were trying to um, allude to. They wanted me to try to connect the institution of the royal institutions in Malaysia with the scholars, or what's with scholasticism. I mean, it's not something that's uh, commonly done but like I said, the disclaimer is that we cannot draw parallels between what we find today in Malaysia and what was in the past when we talk about the Islamic civilization and the sultans and the caliphs of that time. But in order to show this, let's explain a little bit first. Now, the Muslim empire began to expand rapidly when the coming of Islam came to Saudi Arabia by way of the Prophet Muhammad. And in less than 150 years, the Muslim empire spanned from northern Africa, southern Europe, all the way to India, and as far perhaps as Thailand. And that was the Muslim empire, barely 150 years following the death of the Prophet Muhammad. So it was a vast empire. Now the Khalifa, or the leader of the Muslim Ummah, the Muslim community at the time, he had a huge task in order to keep that entire empire prosperous, peaceful. There were also many, many little sultanates, and we wouldn't call them, I mean, even those sultanates, we don't draw parallels with what, what we have in Malaysia because even those sultanates were rather vast. Like, for instance, Persia was ruled by one sultan. Baghdad was with another sultan. <coughs> the caliph was in Baghdad. <coughs> Excuse me. So there's really no parallel between the size of the empire. Anyway, these sultans, another distinguishing feature of them, of theirs, the sultans and the caliphs, they were not ignoramus people. They were people of learning, they were people of culture, they were people of civilized nature. And because of that, they themselves were scholars. Lots of them, not all of them, but a lot of them were scholars themselves. One can bring to mind uh, Ma'mun, the caliph Ma'mun, who lived during the, what they call the Golden Age. He himself was a scholar. Harun al-Rashid also was a very civilized scholarly man who knew literature very well. <coughs> there were many more. <coughs> and because they were intelligent people, civilized people, cultured people, they surrounded themselves with also civilized, intelligent, cultured people. And scholars were the ones that presented that kind of feature for them. Now, these scholars, some of them were their teachers. These scholars were paid handsomely by the caliph, by the sultan, because these were the people who built civilizations, these scholars. These were the people who built civilizations. These were the people who built culture. These were the people who built intelligence for the Muslim world. They were the ones who actually um, forged ahead with progress. It was these scholars, with the help, of course, of the Khalifas and the Sultans. So, the scholars that we know of still exist in our minds today because their works are still extant. There are so many of them. 
Just to name a few, we can say Ghazali, we can say Khwarizmi, we can say Ibn Sina, we can say al Juwaini, we can say Atusi, many, many, many more. Khwarizmi, Umar Khayyam, there were so many of them. And all of these people positively contributed to the advancement of the Islamic civilization. And the reason the Islamic civilization was so sought after by countries beyond their realm was because they knew, these countries beyond the Muslim realm, knew that the Muslims were so progressive, they were so cultured, they were so refined, they came to learn from the Muslims. The 11th century, which is perhaps during the Golden Age, like I said earlier, the 11th century of the Christian calendar, was a time when the vibrant learnings of the Muslims in the Muslim lands were unmatched. I mean, Andalusia, for example. Andalusia at the time was stretching from Portugal, Spain. That was Andalusia. And the Andalusians, they had the cities that they built. They had street lights. They had boulevards. They had a government that ran efficiently. They had a roaring economy. They had a very cultural atmosphere. They had lots of what they call majlis, a lot of uh, intelligent discourse between scholars. People like uh, uh, what? Ibn Rushd, Ibn Yunus. All of these people were there. They were all having vibrant discussions. Whereas just across in the non-Muslim lands, like in southern France, it was part of the dark ages. They were still arguing over petty things, petty things having to do with religion because everything was controlled at the time by the church. Thought was controlled by the church. Land was controlled by the, by the wealthy royalty. The ones who suffered were the common person. Nobody was educated. It was dangerous to have education in such a place because if you had education and you started to argue, then you would be excommunicated or worse. You could suffer the Inquisition. Now back to the Muslim lands, these Khalifas, they surrounded themselves with great scholars like the ones we just mentioned. These great scholars are the people who built civilization. They were the ones who built madrasas. They were the ones who built observatories. They were the ones who built hospitals. They were the ones who built pharmacies. They were the ones who built civilization as a whole. And the Sultans and the Khalifas, they got honor from that. Because whoever came to pay them tribute or pay them respect, they always came precisely because they had such a vast and vibrant and intellectual empire with all these great structures. The big marketplaces, for instance, where they could do their trade. They had laws in place that pro prohibited from cheating, from riba, from all kinds of things. They were, they were a system that was advanced for its time. If you now think that these scholars were paid nothing for what they did, you will be sadly mistaken because these scholars, like I said, they were appreciated because the sultans and the khalifas, they knew their worth because, like I said, lots of them, lots of these khalifas and sultans were themselves uh, scholars, were themselves intellectual people, were themselves poets. So they knew the worth of knowledge and they paid them handsomely. They paid these scholars handsomely. On Astro, I mentioned that they were paid the equivalent of 30,000 US dollars a month. This is after doing a lot of scholastic research as well and changing or converting the, 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 the worth of gold as it was then to the worth of gold today. But 30,000 US dollars a month, you would be hard pressed to find any scholar today paid that kind of money. Any scholar worth his salt is what I'm saying. Now, if we now fast forward to today and we start asking what is the role of the institution of the monarchy and the scholars, how do they, how do they intertwine, especially with regard to this country? As I said, we cannot draw parallels between what happens in this country and the Muslim empire of the past. But what we can do is we can show that the, the monarchs, the royalties, the sultans, the kings, they would be fortunate to have scholars who gave them the right kind of advice. 
they would be fortunate to have scholars who helped build culture, civilization amongst the community. But we don't have that today. We don't have that because the Sultan is not the one today that is employing these people. Today, it's the government that employs them. The Sultan does not pay them either because the Sultan doesn't employ them. And therefore, it's up to the federal government or the state government to pay them. But the state and federal governments, they are not comprised of people of learning and wisdom. And as a result, the people that they hire, they consider them to be all the same. And therefore, there is a certain standard grade that you would be afforded. And that standard grade is pathetic. One cannot be expected to advance any kind of civilization, any kind of progress, given that kind of salary to these scholars today. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so that's number one. Number two, the sultans of the past, as I said, they were intelligent people themselves. But they had these scholars with them because the scholars were the ones that attracted students to come to that land. These students were also themselves scholars. And when they came to that land, they contributed positively to the economy of that land. Look at Timur, for instance. Timur was not a cultured man. He was part of the Mongol horde. But Timur was clever man. And he hired or he had in his employ the best scholars that were existent at the time. And he paid them handsomely. And he ordered them to build the bazaars. He ordered them to build the libraries. He ordered them to build the madrasas and the schools and things like this. And as a result, his name is forever remembered in history because of that. Not because of his ruthlessness, perhaps, although that becomes like a side issue. But all of them, <coughs> all of these sultans and the caliphs, they are remembered today precisely because of their role in history with scholars. And it's the scholars that put them in the forefront of Muslim minds today. It's the scholars. And therefore, we should not treat the scholars with disrespect. We should not think that we can just give them a paltry few thousand to keep them afloat. That's not the way to do things. If you are going to appreciate and respect the scholars, you should pay them what they deserve. How is it that managing directors of banks, who don't really contribute to any kind of progress, and yet they get paid the equivalent of perhaps 30,000 US dollars a month. What about the CEOs of, of uh, sovereign wealth funds? What about the CEOs of accounting firms? You cannot say that they contribute to civilization, nor do they contribute to progress. And yet they get paid handsomely. For what? For keeping the economy afloat. But don't you think that you could do so much more if you had the right guidance from a proper scholar who knew what he was talking about? Now, this is the kind of thing that when it comes to this country, and we already have a separation between the political realm and the royal institution, if the royal members want to say anything, they get criticized by the political institution, thinking that if they want to criticize something to do with the political realm, they have to step down from their royal institution and join politics. That's nonsense. Utter nonsense. The king in particular, the sultan, has a responsibility because he is the head of the religion. He has a duty. If he sees something which is unjust, he should speak up. He should uh, point out the error and he should correct it. That is his, his duty. Not just the responsibility, it's his duty. And therefore, if now we have a royal monarch who talks, who talks uh, about trying to eradicate something which is unjust, we should support that. We should, we should not only support it, we should embrace him for wanting to do that. But then again, there's a caveat. That also is provided he has the right guidance. And judging by what has happened in this country for the past 50 years, maybe, 
one cannot say that we have full confidence that he will do the right thing because we don't think that there is proper advice being afforded him and that's a sad state of affairs he should get people who really know what they're talking about give him the right advice if he doesn't know if he doesn't already know himself and teach the right things you know in Malay language which is derived from the Arabic language usually in the past when you talk about politics you say siyasa today however less and less the Malays are using this word siyasa and they're using the word politic instead but what they mean is they think that the word politic is the same as the word siyasa because if we translate siyasa into English it's politics but let's examine that because if we start talking about siyasa what we really mean is that it has to have a prerequisite this siyasa and what is the prerequisite number one wisdom hikmah number two justice adala these are the two prerequisites you have to have in order for you to say this is what you are doing uh, called siyasa politics does not have that politics is devoid of wisdom and devoid of justice it only favors that which is the majority whether it's right whether it's wrong whether it's ignorant whether it's intelligent it's not so what happens today when they say politic it actually is politic it's not siyasa the same comes with having to administer conditions accorded, uh, afforded by the sultans or the kings. The same has to be said about them. There has to be a siyasa. In other words, there has to be wisdom and there has to be justice. Both of which, the conception of both of which is already found within that purview of the worldview of Islam. If you are not familiar with the worldview of Islam, then you are not going to be familiar with wisdom or justice. <coughs> Therefore, it is incumbent upon the rulers who claim the mantle of authority in regards to religion, which they are, there needs to be the precondition of an understanding of what the Muslim worldview is. In addition to that, you also have to understand what wisdom is and what is justice. What is justice? How to do justice? This is the prerequisite. Do you have those kind of uh, people giving you that kind of advice? I don't think so. In any case, it's been a pleasure. And I'll see you again soon, inshallah.